All right. Welcome everybody to the Ask Applied Business Education Special Interest Group. The Special Interest Group is open to anybody. Um, you don't have to be an Ask Applied member, um, but the Business Education Special Interest Group was is only a couple of years old, and we aim to create resources. We've got research projects and webinars to help business educators and those supporting business educators. So welcome everybody here and a big thank you. My name is Dr. Amanda White. I am one of the committee members of the Business Education SIG and I'm co-hosting today with Danielle Logan who is from Griffith University and Danielle's also managing our chat uh, today as well. So I'm an accountant, uh, Deputy Head Education at the University of Technology Sydney. We have a fantastic panel here today. Just a reminder, of course, that everything is being recorded. And so if you miss anything, you have a technical issue, um, or you have somebody that you think would love to watch the recording a little bit later, then it will be available. I'd like to also start today with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Burra people of the Daru Nation, upon whose ancestral lands the UTS campuses now stand. And uh, I'm, of course, on Darug country up here in northwestern Sydney. We'd also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands. And I welcome everybody, and thank you to Molly for doing that earlier, um, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where you are right now uh, in the meeting chat. So today we have a fantastic program of events, short introductions, we're going to hear some, from some of our fantastic panel today, sharing about what they're currently working on uh, in terms of students as partners. We're going to have a panel discussion about some key questions of how to get started and then audience Q&A. Uh, this webinar came about because I wanted to start a students as partners project, but I was just so overwhelmed with information and I knew that I had seen, for example, Molly and Madeline present on some fantastic initiatives, but I was so overwhelmed, I just didn't know where to start. And so I said to Danielle, why don't we have a webinar about how to get started? Uh, how do you take those first steps and um, you know the mechanics of, of part of that? And also some discussion about why we're getting into this particular area. And we also have a Padlet. Um, if you've got a good idea to share or you've seen something, um, then we have a little Padlet, I'm going to pop the link in the chat as well, where you might share your students as partners projects, something cool that you've seen, or an idea that you might have. And the one that's in there is uh, currently one of my own, we're developing some OER textbooks uh, in accounting. And we've got a students as partners project where students are going to be reviewers on the textbook. We'll have accounting academics reviewing, but we also wanted to have students in there to make sure that um, they felt comfortable in reading the book and they're also doing analysis from an equity diversity and inclusion perspective so we wanted to really have this co-creation so let me start by introducing our fabulous panel and uh, we first have uh, these are in alphabetical order uh, so we first have dr leah coots from griffith university leah is a senior lecturer in music learning and teaching at the queensland conservatorium griffith university her pedagogical practices focus on students as partners, which has been the focus of her research. She also co-chairs Griffith University Students as Partners in Assessment and Feedback Community of Practice with Danielle Logan Fleming, who's my co-host today, which aims to expand the reach of students as partners across disciplines and programs within the university through sharing practices and exploring uh, possibilities. I'm going to read through each, every, each person's bio and then we're going to go through in order and they're going to tell you a little bit about what they've been doing. So our second panelist is Dr. Molly Dollinger. And I had the pleasure of meeting Molly for the first time at STARS um, and was just blown away. So Molly is the Equity First Students as Partners Lecturer at Deakin University. And in her role, she supports university-wide student partnership initi initiatives, including internal grants, a student mentoring staff program, co-design workshops, and student representation. Uh, then next up, we have Madeline Marie Judd from the University of Queensland. Madeline and I met at, I think, the Employability Network 
um, with STARS as well. So that's a really great conference. If you've never heard of STARS, I'll put some details in the chat while our presenters are talking. But Madeline Marie is currently the Service Improvement Manager of Careers at the University of Queensland. Prior to this role, she co-led the design and implementation of Staff Student Partnership Program at UQ from its beginning in 2018 until 2021. Madeline Murray is also a doctoral candidate at Western Sydney University with her research focusing on the policy and practice divide in universities, specifically around culture and graduate attributes. So I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Mad. Then we, last but not least, we have Fiona O'Riordan. And Fiona works as an academic developer in the Teaching Enhancement Unit at Dublin City University. Her current research areas include all things assessment, in particular, academic integrity, uh, partnering with students in assessment is one key way to successfully engage students and promote academic integrity. And Fiona is going to share some of her insights from a project she's currently working on at DCU. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides for a moment and we're going to let Leah, Leah, do you want to take the stage and tell us a bit about what you're doing in the students as partner space? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Amanda and Danielle, for the invitation. And I'm coming from the lands of the Jagera and Turrbal people in Brisbane, Queensland. And thank you for um, that bio that kind of gives you the labels of who I am. But in the students as partners space, I've done a few different things. I've done really small steps into students as partners through just co-designing essay questions with first year students. And that was with 180 students. And then I've had larger scale students as partners initiatives where I've redeveloped a whole course, including assessment. We basically kept learning outcomes and everything else changed. And that was in partnership with 11 honours students, so fourth year research focused students. Um, and currently we're looking at our learning management system online and there's some courses where it's just not well integrated. And so we actually have paid student involvement there um, in relation to what they need from their learning management system and what possibilities there are. So that's a, from a diverse range of students across all year levels, across all the majors within the Bachelor of Music program that I'm program director for. Um, and then we have the community of practice that Danielle and I co-chair and that really is about bringing together people who are interested in this space, who have different levels of experience in this space, but who really come from a place of understanding that to learn and to teach is to connect and build relationships with students and allow them to develop their own relationships, but it's through those relationships with the academics as well that learning and teaching can really grow in interesting ways. And so that's only been, it's nearly a year old, that community of practice. And it's just a fabulous community to share ideas and to grow together. So that's, yeah, a little bit more about me. That sounds fantastic. I love this idea of that community of practice and involving students um, is so important. All right, now I'm just trying to get the slide up for the wonderful Molly Dollinger, except my computer is frozen, so I'm just going to skip ahead here. So uh, Molly, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on uh, over the last few years in terms of students as partners? Yeah, fantastic. So I was very lucky to get to do my PhD on co-creation or students as partners at the Center for the Study of Higher Education at University of Melbourne. And while I was finishing up my PhD there, I was offered a position at La Trobe University to lead centrally a student partnerships portfolio. Um, and so it was myself and three professional staff on that team. And we really sought to create university wide programs and pathways for all students and staff to get engaged in partnership. Um, and more recently, at the beginning of 2022, um, I've always wanted to work at Deakin. It's like the worst kept secret amongst uh, many of my friends. And so when a position arose at Deakin to be the inaugural Equity First Students as Partners Lecturer, um, I, of course, was really happy to accept that. And I have been there since. So as you can tell from my profile, uh, a lot of my work is really about creating university-wide channels and programs. Um, and so I'm interested to hear from the other panelists, as well as the participants, sort of the negotiation of whether these roles should sit uh, centrally or whether it's better in the faculties. There's always that good old debate there. 
but really creating lots of different programs for all types of students and staff, depending on their uh, time, resourcing, what the project is about, and so forth. So that might be micro grants, um, which I know UQ also does. I'm sure Maddie's going to talk about that. Co-design workshops, which are on demand, our students mentoring staff program, which is a one-to-one -one relationship. And then of course, student representation as well. And then all the databases and recognition systems that sit underneath that. The other thing that's fantastic about my job at Deakin is it's not just about creating the practice, but also supporting our academics and our professional staff to also publish in students as partners research because we know that there's so much great work going on and translating that into articles or other scholarly outputs can always be a bit of a barrier for people. Um, so that's something I'm also working on. I just also wanted to present to everyone here some of the big questions that I am thinking about these days and see whether perhaps you uh, resonate or some of these resonate with you. The first is how do we make students as partners equitable? And I don't just mean that uh, for students because of course there's a lot of discussion there about making these roles paid and linking it to employability and so on, but also for staff. So my role is also very much a bit of an academic development role. And so I'm thinking about how students as partners can be recognized in promotions, can be recognized in workload, and the benefits of, of what you know, staff will get out of it by engaging in students as partners. Uh, next is how to balance authenticity uh, in students as partners projects with the reality that many staff who engage in them are really looking for quite specific outcomes and outputs as well. And so in our last community of practice at Deakin, we actually unpacked this question, and I don't know if anyone here also perhaps would like to discuss that today. The third uh, is how to break down the binary between student representation and student partners. So I'm working on a paper at the moment uh, with Kelly Matthews, for those of you who might be aware of her, um, about thinking about how student representation and student partners is often put at odds with one another, but while the two systems both support student voice, how we need to bring them together in order to create a really um, whole picture of how students can engage uh, with uh, the university. And then finally, and this is the one that all my managers I've ever had have always asked me, and it's a good one, uh, which is how do we take students as partners from being these little pockets or these little projects here and there to just BAU work. And um, spoiler, as I put in there, I think work integrated learning play, will play a huge role in, in doing that. So that's me. Fantastic, thanks Molly. And it, oh, some of these questions now just make me think, as someone who's starting out with all of these tricky questions, you also don't wanna make a misstep as well. So this is one of the reasons why we had this uh, webinar is so that you can figure out how to make those first steps. And I'm sure we'll get some great guidance. So last off, oh, sorry, before we go into um, Fiona, I'd like to invite uh, Madeline Marie to take the stage and tell us about her students as partners work. Wonderful, thank you, Amanda. And just also once again to say thank you very much to Amanda and Danielle for having us here today. Um, my name is Madeleine Marie, and I'm also from the Jagara Turable Lands um, on sunny Brisbane. Uh, so I'm from the University of Queensland. And as Amanda mentioned at the beginning, um, I was responsible for co-designing and co-leading the Student Staff Partnerships Program that we have at the University of Queensland. Um, and, over that time, it was a bit, you know, a bit similar to uh, Molly and that was a, a university-wide program that we looked to, to roll out or to develop and then roll out, which led to over a thousand students and 600 staff members collaborating in partnership um, during the three years that I was involved in the program. And so in particular, the stream that I facilitated was um, projects, so getting students and staff members to collaborate on semester long projects together, anywhere from um, reviewing assessment together or um, making assessment items or um, yeah, reviewing the assessment rubrics that went with it to evaluating uh, student experience initiatives at the university. Uh, it's been wonderful in the last couple of years to be able to see the long term impact and outcomes that have occurred throughout the university. And one of the big things that I really wanted to do before kind of leading the student staff partnership space, in particular the program, was to get the program being business as usual so that it wasn't just for that, you know, small cohort 
of students that I was fortunate enough to be able to have that direct relationship with um, those years, but it was more long standing. And I guess at UQ we were really fortunate in the respect that we had a, a similar program called the Summer and Winter Research Scholarship Program uh, that's been, you know, there for years and you know, well over 10, 15 years. And so we had a bit of a, a similar funding model based on that. And um, just before I left, we were able to make our SSP program ongoing beyond the original strategic um, funding that we received. So there was definitely, it was a long journey to get there and it's continuing. But um, I just think that um, it's just such important work to be able to, to collaborate in partnership with students. And it's definitely changed my whole perception of work in higher education, I think, you know, for the rest of my life, I want to work in higher education, and it's something that has fundamentally changed my perceptions about what students are we including in the process and whose knowledge are we valuing when we design, whether it be university courses or units, but then also um, university initiatives as well. And it's really important that students have a place at the table beyond that kind of tokenistic representation, which can sometimes occur. So really looking forward to the conversations today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Madeline Marie. Oh, now I've, here we go. I can, I'm able to now share Fiona's slides. So uh, I'd like to welcome Fiona. Fiona, do you want to tell us, you've got a, obviously a bent in academic integrity and that specialization, but what have you been working on? Thank you very much, Amanda and Danielle, for the invitation and lovely to be here today with everybody. Um, and um, a little bit sort of now, you know, sometimes you take a step forward and two steps back and you think you're kind of, you know, making inroads and helping to drive this student as partnership um, piece ahead. And then I'm looking at some of the questions and some of the challenges that have been brought up already this morning and, and, and you could be a little bit daunted. And I guess my work along with colleagues in DCU, in particular my colleague Rob Lowney, is to try and demystify this um, student partnership piece um, and it it came out of a project I was working on with um, an Erasmus plus project with five other partner universities and our role was to develop supports for academics developing um, assessments to promote academic integrity and as a result of that we developed 12 principles and one category of those principles related to student ownership so the research showed us clearly that students being involved in assessment help to promote academic integrity and this led us to get seek some more funding internally um, and we uh, started exploring the literature and students as partners with a view to demystifying it and giving our staff our educators in D Dublin City University a resource that they could use in a tangible way um, and so this time last year we launched the resource which um, I'll talk to you about briefly in a minute but basically um, in fact you can move on Amanda if you don't mind to the next slide so this because it's it, it is just a very simple resource it might look complicated but it's basically taking um students as partners in assessment we were just looking at student partnership in assessment and um, so it's taking helping educators see how they could partner students sort of at a low level and um, partnership through to a high level because there's an awful lot of fear around designing assessments for partnership and in partnership with students and also to let the educators see that we're doing a lot of this good practice already and um, so some of the low level I suppose stuff looked around choice and negotiating assignment briefs um, and a lot of formative assessment opportunities and then perhaps the more high level partnerships would have been with more mature learners uh, where they could be involved in summative self and formative assessment and co-designing assessment um, so that was the whole point of it to try and demystify so we launched this resource last year we invited staff to get involved and pilot uh, some of these aspects we got uh, 11 educators and staff across the university across no, eight staff across 11 modules uh, to pilot it and so we're at the stage now where we're gathering a lot of that information we're disseminating a lot of it we're writing a few papers but more importantly we're trying to see how we can bring this work to the point where I think Molly was talking about it earlier on where we might maybe try and um, embed some of this into kind of university policies and procedures and I could talk a bit more about that in relation to another project we're doing at the minute which is a university-wide research project around raising academic awareness in the university and this would play part of that and we're going to develop a framework across the university for um, academic integrity and this will pay, play a key part in it. I hope it didn't take too long now uh, giving you some background there. Oh, that's fine. And I think uh, you had this one more slide. Okay. Well, this was just we 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 invited uh, students to to um, 
I suppose, critique our, our, our work to date just before we launched the resource. And, you know, it, it's again not telling us the steam is defying, it's not telling us anything new, but students are very clear about the need and the want to partner. They feel that they are leaders in their own, are experts in their own, expert is the word used, in their own assessment and learning journey and can't understand why we as educators don't partner, partner them more. They don't want to see lots more dialogue with, uh, with um, academic staff um, and with students. They want to see a lot more direction in terms of exemplars and they'll help create those exemplars. Um, they want a lot more um, transparency and fairness across assessments, both within modules, across stages and across programs. And most importantly, they're, they're crying out for more agency in their learning. So it's, it's time we, we took it seriously, I think. Fantastic. I, Thank I, you. I uh, yeah, agree with that, the idea about student agency. I gave my students some choice in assessment with communication skills and they had one choice before and now they've got three different options of how they could be assessed to demonstrate communication skills efficiency uh, and uh, pro competency. And once we gave students choice and they had agency and they could figure out what work worked best for them and their timelines and their schedules, we just saw grades go through the roof. We didn't change the grading scheme at all, but because they were invested and they thought, I'm making this choice, I have control, that it made a really big difference. So. Now we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion. So I'd like to get all of my panelists to turn their microphone, uh, microphones and cameras on. So thanks, Leah. And I think everyone's madly looking for the button to press since uh, not many people would be used to using Collaborate. So, so much good information already in just your little descriptions about what sort of work that you're doing. Uh, so Let's start with the question of why would you implement students as partners? Um, and I don't know who would like to kick that off. I might start with maybe Leah, since um, you've been doing that at the, the con. Why, if, if you were to convince somebody, and I know that I raise this with a lot of my colleagues, I say, oh, I'd love to partner with students to design assessment. And I get a lot of, I have to say, older male academics typically going, well, why would you want to do that? I'm the expert. Uh, why do we want to go down this path? Look, I think for me, so I've always, I mean, my PhD was on student-centred learning and transformative pedagogy and really wanting to come from a place of understanding the student. So if you're trying to convince someone and they're not there yet, then it's likely a harder sell. But for me, it comes down to authenticity and ethics and values that I have. So when I'm teaching I even have trouble with the word teaching because of the connotations of it being so one directional but it comes down to it is I think I said this before but it's about human relationships and how can I impart anything if I don't know who is in front of me but also I don't have all of the answers so in a way it kind of it puts the onus on them so that I can help them learn you know, so I don't know who they are unless I actually invite them to share that with me. And it is a collaboration. So it, it comes from that point for me of my values and what I think teaching is or isn't and who I think is in front of me. Um, but that's not necessarily how I would sell it if someone doesn't share those values. If they share their, those values and they don't know how to get started, you know, maybe that'll come out in a little while on this panel. Um, but the first thing I think is to have somebody understand that when you have buy-in from someone and when you invite information in, then it actually really supports what can grow together. Is that, is that giving away of control, which can be freaky, but if control is just this incorrect perception, we're not in control. If they, we think we can control the curriculum and that will can control their learning, like that's the, one of the largest fallacies I think that is in existence um, that maybe needs to be called into question. Control is an illusion in the first place. I like that. I think that's often the thing that a lot of people are a bit scared of is I'm giving up control and what if it turns into utter chaos? Um, you know, <laughs> sort of like, which could be fun, but I, does anybody else have any um, things they'd like to share about why we want to go down this path and, and why we want to make this path business as usual, as everybody has mentioned? Can I jump in there? Um, jump in, Amanda, Thank you. 
I'm old enough to remember the transition from the Bologna process uh, to the, you know, during the Bologna process from kind of objectives driven education to learner centric education. And I recall being part of that team in a different university that tried to make that move. And we did it with words. We changed learning objectives to learning outcomes. We talked about being learner centric. We weren't learner centric. We, you know, to our shame, we weren't learner centric. I think, you know, let's put our, 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 our money where our mouth is and be learner centric. And to be learner centric, you have to truly respect your student and listen to them and listen to the fact that they want this agency and that they do know their own learning journey best, better than we do. And start treating them like adults because they're going to leave us and go into the big bad world where they have to behave like adults. And if we have retained the control over them and given them no autonomy, then how are we expecting them to go in and work in an autonomous way in industry? Um, in a professional life. So it just makes so much more sense. I can't believe 20 years ago when I was working on this transition that all of this didn't just land in my plate uh, because it would have made life so much easier and we wouldn't have just done semantics and changed words and documents and tried to push it out and say we are now learner centric. Mm. Thank you. I, I'd like um, Molly to jump in. She has a great comment in the chat. It's not hard to argue that higher ed needs a bit of a change now with COVID on top of it, students are no doubt wondering what they are going to get out of it. So do you want to expand a little bit more on that, Molly? Yeah, I mean, I think, has anyone been watching um, The Chair on Netflix? I want anyway, to, but I haven't had time I, yet. There's like a million things you could discuss about The Chair, but my favorite line in The Chair is they're talking about the enrollments in the English department, and they're saying the only... Um, subject that's go that's coming up is creative writing and the dean who is altogether a bad character so i don't mean to make him sound clever here but he says that's because students want to create content the, that's the people don't students don't want to review and reflect old text students want to create and i loved that line and i kind of think it says it all where i think the view or the idea of the university has really turned very negative to most people outside of academia, where it's seen as this place where you get talked at and you take big tests and you get the certification that and you're the only reason you're going is to get the degree and then to get the job. And we've completely lost the beauty of universities and all the, the wonderful learning process that can take place. And I think students as partners is the way we kind of bring that back and remind people that this is university is a time when you can test out ideas and try things. Maybe you're not good at them. Maybe you are and sort of, you know, form your own identity and think about, you know, yourself and what kind of person you want to be. So then maybe that's corny, but that's how I, that's how I would sell it. Oh, I, love, I love that. It was, you know, I think back to, it was still very, I guess, traditional in the sense that when I was at university, in my first degree, we were just seen as buckets to fill. Right? It's just knowledge and you just fill up these buckets. And uh, Madeline has a comment there. The amount of time staff have used the term kids when, when referring to students. Uh, how often does that happen, Madeline? And, and what, do, what do you do there? I sometimes do say that because sometimes they are behaving in, in sometimes my undergraduate classes. Probably, uh, actually, no, I should, my, my eight-year-old throws worse tantrums than some of my students. But is it that we're not thinking of them like the adults that they are? Yeah, that's always been a key concern of mine. I think um, it's kind of like Nell's going down a chalkboard for me when we when we refer to, to students as kids because it kind of undermines their lived experience and you don't know what that person's experience has, have been that brings them into higher education as well. And so one of the things that I've been really trying to do and really try to push my colleagues is to not be making these presumptions about people that are sitting across the table from us as well and then that's where the power of partnership comes in because um, you have to get to know people not necessarily as a as a fellow you know learner but also just as a human at the other side of it who has their own challenges who has their own barriers in life um, and you know we as staff members also have the same thing um, you know we have our own challenges as well so it's a great way to humanize higher education um, and one of the other things that I would mention especially at the beginning stages where there'd be those st uh, staff members that 
you know, were kind of interested in the concept or the notion of partnership, but they had a, a few hesitations, was um, I would talk to them about, for example, the student evaluation of courses and teaching um, and how that, you know, you do have some limitations, of course, with student evaluation, whether it be low uptake or the fact that, you know, it's such a, a one-way kind of um, feedback approach. And so by being able to engage a partnership with students, you're able to unpack what those issues are or what some of those key challenges are or barriers to learning and work through students in a process to actually better it for the next generation of students as well. Um, but I would usually say to those staff members that were incredibly resistant, um, I would more so look at that as a long-term conversation with them rather than really trying to win them on partnership because I can only imagine from a student perspective if that staff member has all of those barriers to engaging in partnership, how horrible must it be for the student that's on the receiving end of that as well. Mm. And that brings up a really great point that was asked by Victoria in the chat that some colleagues seem really disconnected from students and they don't value that student voice. Uh, I've been, I hear that sometimes around the, well, I used to when I was walking around the office when uh, student evaluations would come back. I said, oh, how, would, how are evaluations? Oh, students don't know anything about learning. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure they know a lot about themselves and they're reflecting on their experiences and comparing it to others. And um, it's, it's really hard to try and open some people to accepting that student voice and Molly mentioned that you know being a great teacher is a, a continual learning process and people say oh look Amanda you must have it all figured out right you've won a teaching excellence award like everything must go well all the time in which I say oh look I tried an exercise last week that I thought would be great to help students better understand a concept and when I polled them using Mentimeter at the end of the class turns out it just didn't hit the mark and so I need to go back and rethink. Um, and uh, yeah, it's this really, you know, I'm always trying to improve, just like we're always trying to improve in our research, about yeah, trying to figure out a way to try and always encourage our colleagues. One of the things I do, which is a little bit of a guerrilla tactic, this might help you, Victoria, is with anybody else out there, I tell students, if you see something in a subject that you really like, in your other subject feedback surveys, yes. right, we had this option or we did this in the other subject and it was so powerful and I think it could be really useful here. Mm. And uh, I try to get, get them to, back in the days when recording lectures seemed like, no, my university was like, we're never gonna record lectures. That seems crazy. Why would we ever record lectures? Um, I had my students doing that type of uh, campaign amongst themselves of whatever you think is working well, share it in other places. So I and Molly mentioned about creating and one of the, the most engaging activities I ever do is I get students to create something and then they pass it to another table and they add something on and we pass it on to another table and they add on again. And that sort of approach for my students, they just really get into it. Um, on to what students as partners might look in like in a business discipline. I might go to, um, I don't know, does anybody have any examples of co-creating assessment that they might like to share? Can I just add to some of oh, yeah, the sure, previous Liam. discussion and then it might lead into this. I think one of the challenges is that we can assume that students are like dying for this opportunity, but I've also seen it fall flat on its face when somebody had in their mind, oh, okay involve students and they'd never involved students before and it was like this switch in their teaching and mm. they had no rapport with the students that students didn't see them as poten potentially um <coughs> an empathetic teacher beforehand and they've just come in and gone okay you're going to choose what you're going to do and you can be as creative as you like this is the learning outcome i don't care how you get there and there was no scaffolding or supporting or let's build this together or figure to figure it out together and so um, I was just saying to, to Chris there, who said, you know, it can be scary for academics. Like there also needs to be professional learning opportunities for academics to, without this sounding terrible, but to develop the right people skills. 
because without those types of people skills and seeing students as people and equals in their own right, then students may be ready, but they may not feel safe in the environment. And that comes to your question. I, I think it doesn't matter which discipline, it first of all has to come from, is it a safe environment for students' voices to be heard? And how do you respond to students whose ideas aren't possible for whatever reason? And if you don't have those negotiation type skills or have, and in those opportunities, in those situations, I ask students, I just keep asking questions and they figure out what's possible or not. So being that person who can steer problem solving or ask questions and give up, give up the I know the answer that I want them to find and actually come from, I don't know what this is going to look like, let's find out and actually mean it. Um, sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but <laughs> I just, yeah, always come back to are the people skills there to support the students because if the students are ready but the environment isn't safe enough it's still not going to be the right match mm, that's such a big one i i talked to a student recently who said i just don't feel comfortable in giving feedback to a, another academic about how they just really weren't enjoying the class because i said i just i don't know if i can trust them to take that feedback and not receive retaliation and that's often a concern that students might have um, I fear I, I, yeah, just just on that, I think there was loads of things I wanted to say, gosh, and I keep kind of saying, I, I'll try and hold back, but just on that last point, the more um, I am seeing about, the more I see about the way we are trying to promote academic integrity, the more I see it's just really good practice. And it's all about scaffolding, it's all about integration and having a planned structure. And so things shouldn't happen by accident and they should happen in a supportive environment. And we should be talking to each other, our colleagues, and trying to decide what level of partnership we will have and in what context. Um, and I think if we have more of those conversations with our colleagues and with our students, we'll have a much more exciting um, and authentic learning environment. And just one other thing that came to mind earlier, our students are fine with us messing up. They're actually much more excited about the fact that we're taking chances, that we're trying something new. And they're our biggest supporters when we make a mistake, but they do not support us when we resist change and we just continue with the traditional model because it's safe for us. That's what they resent most of all. I have fallen flat on my face so many times and the students are the ones that support me back up again, often more so than my colleagues, because they're with you in the game, you know? It's trust, I, they trust just, us and we should trust them. I wanna take a short tangent because Carmen asked how to manage the power differentials in a students as partners type of environment. And uh, Madeline, you mentioned even something as simple as not meeting in your office. But have you got any other tips for us on, on this type of area? Yeah, I think a lot of mine are just practical and what I've just learned throughout the last few years. And it's really differed depending upon the students I've engaged with. But one of the big things, and because I've been fortunate enough to see so many staff members, whether they are academic or professional members, engage in partnership with students is I noticed that Sometimes we have a tendency to take up a lot of the conversation and leave little space for students to be um, to give them an opening or a window to contribute to it. And so sometimes it's rather than, you know, and also as staff members, we kind of might be slightly institutionalized in higher education. And so sometimes might be a little bit more negative about whether or not things will work. And so providing that space to kind of fail together as well, um, to use it as a learning opportunity and not to always shoot down ideas, but to create that space and also um, to, yeah, as I mentioned in the chat, to talk less and listen more um, and not always fill that gap and allow for that sometimes awkward silence so that, you know, students can have that space to be able to contribute their ideas and perspectives. Hmm. Molly, anything to add since you've had such a, a huge experience in implementing this when you were at La Trobe? Yeah, I mean, I've seen projects that, you know, uh, like Maddie, and I'm sure many others here, lots that go fantastic and lots that fall completely flat on their face and, um, and been involved in projects that have completely failed as well, quite honestly. And a lot of it does come down to staff having and taking the time 
to be able to develop those relationships, to talk to them as colleagues, to make it clear to them that they understand students as partners. Because the other thing is that sometimes we throw the students into this idea of students as partners and they don't even self-identify as student partners. They don't know what that means. So, you know, walking them through the literature, this is why it's different than student casual work. I'm not just paying you to do a task. I'm, I'm paying you to be part of a process with me to help teach me as well along in this journey. Those kinds of things are, are not always made clear to them. I think that's an important first step that maybe when I was thinking about this, I hadn't even considered the, what does it mean to be a student partner how is that different um, from being a student representative, though there is part of that in student voice? Um, I'm just looking at the chat here, there's been lots of discussion about uh, filling the silence. I am terrible at doing, well, I do it a lot, which means I'm terrible at allowing the silence, I guess. Um, I was wondering if I could ask Fiona to share what some of your students as partners work looks like in terms of assessment and feedback. Thank you. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, different examples going on, but uh, currently co-designing rubrics um, seems to be a very safe place for staff to start when they're when they're not too sure. Um, and this is we're finding we've kind of got some preliminary results on a couple of the pilots um, that students often um, are citing this as the first time they realized there were rubrics for their assessments, which isn't the case, by the way. But it's just interesting to see you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. They're actually looking at a rubric in advance of doing their assessment and uh, the co-design element. Um, self and peer assessment are huge as well. And again, can feel like low risk. So you can do them in the formative space or the summative space. And we've had quite a lot of success in the summative space around that as well. Um, so there are lots of simple techniques around, around that. I mean, we, we'd like to move more into kind of co-designing assessments. We do have examples of people who are negotiating briefs. But that's a little bit different. We'd like to start with a blank page and co-design assessment. Um, but yes, I have to say, and, and also a lot of this good practice is going on before we started this project, to be honest with you. We just weren't putting it into the student as partners uh, space. Is that answering some of your question? Can, can yeah, I at this point, sure. can I give a good ex an example of a colleague of mine working in Maynooth University, which is kind of interesting. She uh, works on the professional program, the Professional Start for Teaching and Learning, and she has students assess the lecturers on their assessment design. So they have to critique and design an assessment for a module they're currently teaching on, and then the students on that module assess the assessment design. <laughs> that their lectures have de developed using rubrics. It's kind of cool, you know, it's an interesting um, an interesting perspective and certainly a kind of a reverse of the student partnership thing that we've been thinking about. Does anybody have any other examples of places where we might start? So we've talked about co-creating rubrics, self and peer assessment. Um, if we're, people are wanting to jump into this space but just trying it out in a small way, what else might any of our panel suggest about a good place to get started? I think even giving choice about how to demonstrate learning outcomes. So whether it's a course that is usually very heavily essay written or academic writing based, um, some things that we've had is just being able for students to say, well, can I do a podcast or can I create a vlog instead and it doesn't it doesn't negate the need to reference it doesn't negate the need to back up you know their understanding of certain topics with academic rigor it's just communicating in ways that are more 21st century or more relevant to their world or more even real world relevant outside of academia in terms of what skills they might need going out into the business world or going out as an entrepreneur or many other professions and I think that can be scary because we're used to marking written words, um, but that's where I suppose that could also align with developing the rubrics together, but it doesn't change the criteria that you're marking too. So that's another idea that we've played with. Thanks, Leah. Um, some great examples also coming up in the chat where uh, student partners gave the tutors feedback on the assessment feedback that was provided to students. So I guess it would be things like, 
oh, they use this word a lot and this was not clear or I didn't understand what that meant. Um, I know that there's also lots of discussion on feedback in terms of, oh, well, written feedback can sometimes feel a bit cold and students have found that uh, audio feedback has been good. Molly mentioned co-creating learning resources and in one of the subjects at my university that has quite a lot of students, they've had students for a very long time create, you know, short learning videos um, as part of assessment. And they thought that it would result in lots of great content that they could use. But what they found uh, each year is they maybe only pick one or two because the others are, you know, there's a, a technical error or something uh, involved there. Molly, for co-creating learning resources, what tips would you have for people so that this goes well and it doesn't result in students creating a lot of stuff that maybe you can't use? Yeah, well, I mean, shameless plug, I will uh, point everyone to Hassan Khosravi out of UQ, who has this wonderful platform called Ripple, which I believe is still free for everyone to use. So I would contact him if you're interested. But through this platform, uh, essentially, students can submit resources and they sit with the academics to approve so they can moderate them or you could do the settings. And so the students actually moderate each other's resources. So they're going through them. They know they might not be right. They know they're peer created. And so it's a huge learning process and they can actually rate the learning resources as well, uh, like you would Netflix. And then it can actually recommend learning resources based on topics that they might be struggling with or other types of questions that they like. So anyways, that is the future of higher ed. That is, so about it. <laughs> that is so clever. I think even but doing it manually would not be very easy. <laughs> but I just wanted to add that in our research, we weren't the first people to figure this out. Um, other people have said so as well. What we see is there's really only 10% of a population who want to co-create uh, re learning resources or really be like lead users for our, so I think it's important and lots more students around more like 60% are happy to use each other's resources are happy to rate recommend moderate and so on but especially in contexts where like like learning as opposed to TikTok or Instagram where there's no wrong answers on Instagram well there are some wrong answers on Instagram but anyways um it can be pretty intimidating for students so i think it's great to allow it as an option and it is a way to create new resources every year as a teacher without having to necessarily do the work but you shouldn't expect every single student to want to do it mm, that's a really good point there and i think as as i've been listening to all this i think if we want students to be able to co-create resources if they're interested there also needs to be that feedback mechanism to be able to give them feedback and for the students to be able to give it another go so that then you might end up with something um, that is usable. And that's exactly what YouTube does. YouTube, you know, looks at what you've watched. It looks for keywords. It looks at what rates highly. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of this discussion of, oh, well, you know, Netflix for education is YouTube, just Netflix for education. Uh, and, it's interesting because students co-creating resources for learning and study notes. I look on Course Hero, I look on Studoc, and there are plenty of students like, oh, here are my notes for constitutional law, here are my notes for biology, so that they can get access to other resources. I think what's going to be really important when we're talking about sharing co-created resources as well is the academic integrity discussion about what is good to share and what are things that might sort of move you into that uh, breach of academic integrity space like well maybe things that we wouldn't share would be our submitted assignments um, to others just because that creates additional academic integrity risk when Molly mentioned 10 percent of the population actually want to co-create this got me into a, another thinking about another issue and i'm taking over a subject that will have more than 2,000 students next year it has always had this co-creation of content assessment as an extra 10% extra credit assessment. And Molly, you mentioned earlier, there were, I think, I can't remember, Molly or Mad, you mentioned equity issues in um, students as partners. So I don't know who, I can't remember who that was. Was that you, Molly? Do you want to expand on that a little bit? I always worry, and I dropped the extra credit assessment task 
because where I was involved in this conversation on Twitter where they say, well, look, extra credit is great for students who have capacity, mm. but it creates equity issues for a lot of other students. Yeah, it is a huge issue. I mean, there's two types of students as partners, right? There's the co-curricular and then there's the curricular. In the co-curricular space, the way to improve equity is to pay students, um, to make it really attractive in a position um, that a lot of students want to do. One of the things that I um, often rally against in my various roles at different institutions is paying um, student reps who were elected rather than appointed because we know student elections are um, not necessarily the most equal spaces for students to compete, to have a voice. One of the great things about student partnership is it's, I mean, I've never seen it done by elections. I don't know if anyone else has seen something like that, but we're typically selecting the students and we're normally selecting them, in most of the examples I've seen, for students who do have unique perspectives or something to add to the dialogue and the conversation that we don't get to hear as often. Um, as far as making it equitable within the class, yeah, that is really considering do people have, um, you know, some of those assignments that some students love, the really, really big ones that take loads of time, you know, they're not the most equitable because people who have part time work and and so forth, they're just trying to get through the subject um, to get to the next one and so on. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we still have to allow for spaces and pathways in universities for that to be the case. So if you're going to embed student partnership within your subject, you do have to, to I think, you know, consider it uh, for all students and, and just be realistic about uh, what students may want to engage. Hmm, thanks, Molly. Does anybody else want to jump in on this one before I move on to our next question? Yeah, I think um, just to kind of add to that, I don't think that there is, um, there's by no means any kind of simple answer for it. And that was something that I know Molly and I have talked about a few times and we really grappled with at UQ and um, we were just really rec recognizant of we, especially in a lot of disciplines, there's not, the, the, there wasn't the space at UQ to be able to um, allow them to have for credit options as well and so um, in that case we were fortunate enough to come up with the the grant scheme by but you know that of course poses so many other challenges um, as well with it That's sorry fantastic. i also just oh, want yeah, to add Molly? one more thing of course because it really irks me sometimes we get student staff who say, Molly, I want a student partner, but I don't just want any student partner. I want a student partner with video creation skills or graphic design, or I want a student partner who can help me build a website or all these other ridiculous requests. And they forget the fact that student partnership is about harnessing the student expertise. It is a learning opportunity and that is it. It is not student casual work. You should not go into it assuming that they have media creation skills or that they can do a literature review for you or what other crazy things that you might be thinking about. So if your project is not just based on, I need to understand the student experience, then I would ask you to think about whether that is a student partnership project. That's my end of my rant. <laughs> oh, I think that's an excellent rant. And I've mentioned, uh, and both uh, Maddie mentioned, you know, that, that's hiring a casual, like, you know, or a, a student intern there, if you're expecting them to come and provide those skills like you would uh, pay with consulting. So we've talked about some of the practical aspects of how do we get started. Are there any policy, I guess, things you should check, uh, areas that you need to maybe confirm with something or, or policy things you need to be aware of in terms of navigating this space? Um, I don't know who wants to jump in on this one. I can share some workarounds. Sure, thank you. What work we like, I use a lot of workarounds, so workarounds can be good. <laughs> While policy catches up. <laughs> um, so there's always the challenge of the course profile and the administration of a course. It needs to be finalised well in advance of the students even enrolling in the course. And so that poses some challenges about having space to co-design assessment with students and the like. And 
one advice I got was you can be creative with your wording. So for example, if you have an assessment item that is a portfolio of works, you can then say that, that what that portfolio will entail will be negotiated with students. <laughs> and you know, like yes, I did have to assign percentage percentages or say how many tasks would be involved. So I had to provide some kind of framework but then just also then had to have a date of when things would be finalised and where students would access that information. So that was on their course site rather than the course profile. That was um, the big one that I first came across when you know I had colleagues saying, but haven't you broken policy because you didn't have these? I'm like, oh, did I? <laughs> Whoops. No, but the, this was the advice I had. If you use some of that, those workarounds and create space as long as for us anyway, you provide a specific date of when things will be finalised so that students know what's happening. So, yeah, that's a course level. That's a good workaround because in the discussion of co-creating a rubric, um, to get a subject approved, I have to create the rubric with all of its components and that rubric has to be approved by the faculty course committee before it can you know, go somewhere. So I now think, oh, if I wanted them to help co-create a rubric, how would I get that to work if anybody has any suggestions or examples of what they've done you could also provide um, an example of what it might look like so using a past rubric as an indicator of the standards of what students can expect maybe I don't know whether that would be sufficient but I mean for me some of my projects I've had learning and teaching grants for this work knowing that it's innovative or, or new type of work and that has also given me some space to play <laughs> so to speak. Hmm. Does anybody else want to jump in here and where there's no policy on students as partners, what do you do? We just give it a go and then if, <laughs> was it better to ask for forgiveness than permission? We, we, we have quite a bit of freedom within the European higher education area um, and the NQEC quality assurance um, guidelines so all we have to do with validation is to say what, what kind of split we're going to have 30 70 for exam or end of term exam and 70 for continuous assessment and right up to the day the semester starts that 70 percent is up for grabs in terms of how we want to uh, create the continuous assessment so we have a lot of freedom a lot more I think than, than um, our educating staff think educator staff think uh, so we are lucky in that regard now there are those who can that there are rules within faculties that have sort of been inherited and they can be tricky to navigate sometimes where there's you know we've never done it like that and you can kind of try and gently uh, tease that out and say but perhaps there is an opportunity to do it but we we, we do have that facility in, in Ireland and across Europe where, where um, we have a lot of flexibility a question for Molly and for Mads, where you've been, have they decided to create a policy around students as partners? Uh, is it sort of formally enshrined anywhere that you've, we've got this um, student-centred approach? Uh, would you like me to start off, Molly? Yeah, I'll get you um, to start off. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So um, at UQ, so we didn't have any specific policy on students as partners, but we were really fortunate in that we had what was called a, a student strategy uh, that occurred from around 2017, 2018 to about 2020. And in that student strategy, um, one of the, the key kind of projects or programs was establishing our students as partners or student staff partnerships program. So in a way, we did get, you know, licensed to be creative and innovative in that space through that um, and it's also been enshrined in the UQ um, strategic plan as well and much of that has been um, you know a large part of that has been due to the efforts for a long time for people like Kelly Matthews so I think we're really fortunate to have um, such a powerhouse of an academic champion um, who has you know really led been one of the key leaders in this space nas uh, nationally and internationally um, so I know she uh, lobbied a lot of the senior execs to make sure that it was front of mind whenever um, you know when the strategy was being developed And Molly, is anything to share yeah, in regard? Yeah, very similar situation to Mads. Uh, and I was just going to say uh, at Texas Standards as well are essentially 
have a conversation with the student once every five years. Uh, and that's about it. So still a lot of oh, room to grow oh, in the policy space. Oh, well, maybe this is something we could lobby Texas for. Actually, I don't know if we want to lobby Texas for more guidance on this because I'm not sure that um, <laughs> they do a great job at some things, but I, I wonder whether this might be something that is, is better handled at the grassroots level. Um, so for are there any specific events, conferences for people who want to get involved more to find out more? about students as partners. Um, where can we go for more information? Are there like, is there a collective of students as partners, advocates working together? I know that there's something called Student Voice Australia. Is that for students and academics? Where would you recommend that we go? Oh, I can see stuff in the chat. So uh, the WSU Students as Partners Roundtable Kelly Matthews has a Students Partners Network, Student Voice Australia Network. Okay, we will find some links to go with those as well and put them in the blog post. Um, now, we're at the section of the uh, event tonight where we've got Q&A. Oh, and thank you, Molly, for Neshi. So I'm going to take all of these. We're going to write a blog post about tonight and I'll put all of these links in there as well. So if you have any questions for either the panel in general or somebody specific on the panel, uh, please let us know in the chat. Oh, thank you, Ty. I think it's Ty. There's some Twitter accounts to follow. Um, are there specific journals that we'd be going to read about this in? Or is it books, is it journals? Oh, there you go. International Journal for Students as Partners. That makes it nice and easy. I presume that uh, for anybody who's come to STARS before, um, I'm sure that this would be something in the Student Success Journal probably that comes out as well. Oh, Molly, tell us about this book that you've recommended. I mean, I haven't actually read it yet, which I blame the chair for, because when there's a TV and a book option and both might lead to professional development, it's not a very fair fight. But <laughs> um, it is it's about Peter Filton is one of the main students as partners, um, you know, scholars and academics. And I think um, the book, I think, <laughs> is really arguing for the importance of relationship rich education in uh, higher education and how universities can, you know, stop students from just being feeling like a number. Mm, awesome. I think that's that's going to be my big challenge next year with 2000 plus students. How do I and I feel my students feel like we have pretty good relationships now when I only have 350 and I wonder how that's going to work. Now, there's a great question here um, from Victoria Clown. She's from UNSW. Is there a guidance for starting off with academics to talk to students? Um, is there any structure for, for facilitating a session that you might recommend? And Victor, if you want to unmute, did I explain your question correctly? Explain your question correctly? Yes, that's that's correct. And it's it's sort of, I'm having a challenge at the moment getting um, academics to actually read the student feedback. And so then I'm thinking, how can I scale up to the next step, talking to real life students? Um, some of my colleagues are not really valuing student voices and it's a real challenge to kind of turn around their thinking. So it'd be great to hear your ideas. Go for it, Leah. Thank you. I, I think we have to also think of, you know, the old bell curve, but there's early adopters that are probably people here. There's people who will come on board over time as they get used to it, as the ideas are socialised or they start to understand things more. That might be the majority of people over time. But there's also just some people who are either so stuck in their ways or stubborn or just don't have the same values that are very hard to bring on board. So if it's the people who 
values don't align with students as partners, probably see if there's a larger pool of people who are open to conversations. It's just like, it reminds me of activism, you know, like any form of activism, there's going to be people who you can plant seeds, they'll think about it. And over time, they might do their own research and then start to ask questions and come to you. Or there's people who just shut down, you can't even engage. So you maybe want to choose your time and space wisely to grow those people who you can plant seeds and they start to ask questions and become curious. Thanks, Leah. Does anybody have any other suggestions that might help Victoria around here? I know what doesn't work. What doesn't work is uh, having a low, someone receiving a low rating on their subject as a subject of concern and then um, the university sending them to, you know, oh, look, you must improve, you must do these things. I find that quite often when I've been in that boat and delivering the news to someone, oh, you have to make these changes these ratings are, sh are saying this, um, but quite often the change ends up being just, what is the easiest way I can tick the box rather than what way can I actually make a uh, real change? So does anybody have any other suggestions? Madeline. Yeah, one of the things I would say is um, in my experience, kind of making people do partnership is one of the, um, the worst circumstances there can be because I always think of that you know that poor student or those poor students who are on the receiving end of it when that staff member isn't open-minded to engage in partnership and is not respecting them um, as a, a valued contributor as well and so part of my approach with anything I do in higher education is to start with the people that um, are are friendly with with the concept and in this case that um, are open to the values and the ethos that kind of guide what SAP is all about and using and you know highlighting those people as exemplars as well so one of the first thing one of the things that we did in the first year of the program was um, the program I've been running for about four months and we asked um, we tapped some academics on the shoulders who had done some great work in this space to present their own experiences in partnership with students at a teaching and learning week and then so we were kind of getting a whole range of different academics that you know might not necessarily have been so willing to engage in this space before so really kind of um, highlighting the great work of colleagues can be a great way to do that as well. Awesome. One thing that I've tried um, that might be also helpful is inviting that person along to a class to see me engage with students in a way that is more based on a partnership model than a, a didactic teaching model. Um, and sometimes it does look a little bit chaotic, uh, but you know, then they might say, oh, well, actually, Chaos is actually students engaged, it's students involved in activities and sometimes seeing the proof in the pudding um, can be uh, useful. Though trying to get them there sometimes can be the difficult part. But do we have any other questions that people want to ask? I'm just going to scroll back through the chat. Danielle, is there anything um, that I might have missed that you think might be a, a useful question? Thanks, Amanda. Um, I think we're right. We're up to date with the questions. I've been, as we're talking, I've been putting things across in your Padlet, though, um, out of the chat and, and sort of uh, putting them up here, including some of the links. And uh, perhaps it would be worth sort of having a little look over what's in the Padlet there and considering whether there might be um, some questions arising from that or some uh, comments, perhaps, Perfect. with the ideas that we have. I will see if I can get this to work. <laughs> I'm going to put the link back to the Padlet in a, into the yeah. chat for everybody. Okay. So. Oh, yes. Excellent. So I've had big success sometimes with using the um, screen share function in Collaborate. So there's this fantastic uh, resource here, all of this information about student voice. Um, there's a great small steps suggestion about negotiating assessment due dates. Um, and uh, we've got tutor feedback, which we talked about the tutors, students as partners giving feedback on the tutors and their ability to give feedback to students. Uh, oh, yeah, we've got the uh, assessments. Students interview educational leaders. And I think Elaine's dashed off, um, but she was sharing this one. 
Um, they have students interviewing the heads of disciplines about how they learn and creating short vignettes and playing those around the university. And that might be a really uh, interesting reflective task for academics as, as well as students. Inclusive assessment. At Deakin, colleagues from Cradle and I are working on an inclusive assessment project. Five student partners who will facilitate a series of co-design workshops. Oh, this must be written by Molly because I know that um, collabs, I, I think collabs is, is a word I hear from her a lot. Uh, with their peers to understand how assessment can be made more inclusive for everyone. I think that one's a, a fantastic idea there. Um, the students designing quizzes. Um, I don't know if anybody has tried Peerwise before, but Peerwise, I think was run out of New Zealand and uh, it has a system where you can enroll your students, they can create their own quiz questions for each other, upvote, downvote, um, I, I like that idea of, of the quiz creation. Oh yes, University of Auckland, thank you, Sally. Um, but it's it's a great uh, example of, again, it could be a class activity of, oh, well design a question about this and then design the assessment, or well, not the assessment, but uh, I guess the explanation guide. And then um, I've had students create them and then swap with another table and then have a go at trying to uh, <laughs> do the actual task. It's, oh, this wasn't clear or this wasn't clear. Um, but I've never thought of actually using them in an exam before. Uh, another one in the chat, another tip for getting started is being vulnerable with students and saying there's something in the course where we need their thoughts and input uh, to make it better. I've found this helps challenge the power dynamic and roles from the outset. Fantastic. Um, uh, at Deakin, they've got students and staff creating the five-year strategic plan there. Uh, connecting in workshops, a design thinking workshop for a unit that is being redesigned, including alumni, current students, current and past teaching staff, educational designers and developers. I love this idea there. Um, that's a great one. I've seen this at the program level, at the you know entire degree level but not on a, an individual subject. I did do that the last time I, I constructed my current subject that I teach, um, but not part of any official program. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to talk to all these people and I just sort of set up meetings with them. Oh, there's the Ripple paper, which is fantastic. Uh, students to co-create icebreaker activities. I like that one. Um, or even the, it might be a, the question. I always ask a question at the beginning of the class. Uh, favorite dessert of the week. Um, what are you binge watching? So uh, that could be one that you could do. The learning vignettes, I think, oh, quiet students. I also think not to discount the quiet students. Even working in partnership in classroom where only a few seem to want to talk, others are listening and learning and growing their buy-in because they're seeing their peers see discussions and decisions. Ah, oh, I love that one. That is so good. What else we've talked about? Oh, this program led. Uh, and then the one I added there as well. So I've got students reviewing a textbook. So thank you so much for all of those. Danielle? Amanda, yeah, I was just going to say the notion of program led as somewhere to start is also uh, not a bad idea. Uh, we recently recreated our whole batch of business degree and we had students as partners involved in that uh, and I think um, you know there's lots of ways to involve students in review um, of your programs uh, and having their voice and, and that was a really powerful way to I guess dip our toe uh, in students as partners and uh, I'm not sure whether Leah would like to share but I know that at Griffith uh, we have a new strategic plan and a new assessment policy that does now specifically refer to students as partners so we're starting to see it uh, embedded at a granular level uh, but we're still defining what that looks like in this space uh, so things mm. like a, a program led approach is actually um, you know, review discussions um, being involved in those conversations is a nice way to start as well. Mm. Victoria mentioned at UNSW when they redesigned the Bachelor of Commerce students were included in design aspect panels Victoria, once you got past that initial review down into the nitty gritty of creating subjects and, and getting things up and running, was there still student engagement and um, that uh, student voice? 
Yes, there still was because we we went from design principles, things like authentic assessment, flexibility, and then we we came up with eight eight courses that were entirely integrated across different disciplines. And each of those eight courses on the design panel, there was a student as well, and and also an industry person. So I was involved in this uh, the course Com One One Forty Financial Management, and so we had uh, a student, and we had someone from industry, and then the academics, and we all kind of co-created like through storyboarding the course. That sounds so interesting, and I presume that teaching and learning provided some advice and and how to <laughs> get all of this to work. Yeah, they did, and they they provided yeah the advice, the the recruitment of participants, and uh, yeah, it was it was really well set up. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, okay. I'm just going back through the chat. Oh, there's other things being added uh, all the time. Uh, so thank you again to Danielle for adding those things. I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, and Molly mentioned a community of practice. Uh, oh, sorry, Madeline Marie mentioned a community of practice where people can discuss challenges. Um, and, and Molly mentioned regardless of whether a uni has a central team role it's good to have a students as partner steering group or a group of people whose responsibility it is to regularly discuss progress. I know in my business school, our new teaching and learning policy talks about co-creating the learning environment with students, but that doesn't appear um, in the higher level sort of policy and strategy yet. But I think that there's so much we could do to suggest that that heads in that specific direction so that it becomes the business as usual type of approach um, that we'd all like it, it to be. So are there any more questions? We're actually running a little ahead of time, but there's been so much great discussion. And thank you to all the people who have been here. We talked about how maybe eight seconds was the uh, online pause, so I will wait. All right, I think that was a well enough um, uncomfortable pause. I, I thought I might wrap up with asking each of our panel members, and I'm springing this on them, is there one last thing that they'd like to um, share with our webinar audience? Today, it could be something you wanna plug, something to think about. Uh, I might start with uh, Leah first, I'm just gonna go al alphabetically. Leah, is there one last final nugget or something you'd love to share with us? Mm. I think it's just remembering that nothing cool happens in your comfort zone. You know, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but it, it may feel risky getting started, but it's just conversations and it's just opening up to receive as well as to give. Um, so I suppose just asking a question that you haven't asked students before can literally be the start of this unfolding into something bigger. Oh, I love that. I love that. Nothing fantastic happens in your comfort zone. Molly, if you're still there, have you got one last thing that uh, you want to leave with everybody? I mean, I just want to emphasize what Leah so beautifully just said um, around giving and receiving. And yeah, and just remembering that it is a reciprocal learning process and maybe a good place to start is to think about what it is that you want to learn from students and then go from there. Awesome. Madeline Marie. Yeah, I think those are great points and to be um, to kind of build off that as well is to be explicit with students about what you are hoping to learn from them as well. So it really 
uh, centers you as a mutual learner in the process. But one of the big things that I always say to staff members is um, partnership always takes so much more time than you originally anticipate as well. And so to make sure um, that you have the time because there's been countless, you know, we've all had that, you know, circumstances whereby we go in with the best of intentions and then sometimes, you know, life just throws us, um, you know, a new challenge and we don't anticipate it. And so one, it's really important to be open and honest with students as much as possible about those challenges that you might be encountering, but also go into it knowing that it's probably going to take you a lot more time than you originally anticipated. And that's the whole, you know, purpose I see of partnership. And it takes a long time to break, you know, to break down those power dynamics and to, in a way, um, like I mentioned before, you know, be able to each see each other as a human rather than necessarily as, you know, a professional staff member or, or an academic or a student. So, yeah, just make sure you have enough time as well. well that's something we have heaps of at university. So it's, but it's, it's making, I think it's creating the space, valuing it so that we say, look, this is important and we're going to make the time to make this happen. Um, all right. And last but not least, Fiona. One last thing for everyone to take away. Thanks very much, Amanda, and indeed uh, the, all, all the other panellists. Um, and I suppose what I would um, always like to share with colleagues interested is what you talked about valuing. I always learn so much more from conversations with students than I do from a huge amount of engagement with the literature. So every time I'm looking for a solution for anything, my, my recommendation will be ask your students first, then go to the literature and validate it or find examples of how that's put in practice. But to go to the literature first is just like a minefield and your students have those answers in abundance every time and uh, you know it's just such a lovely starting point to me and um, that's some that's some great advice I think I've done the uh, paralysis by analysis before in taking that first step of I looked at the literature and just being totally overwhelmed um, I want to thank all of our panelists today thank you to Leah to Molly to Madeline Marie uh, to Fiona thank you to Danielle who's been fantastic on updating the Padlet and uh, helping me with the chat we hope that you've got something useful out of today and that like me you're willing to take that first step as Leah mentioned it's just a conversation I'd have to make sure I remember it's just a conversation um, and what we can learn and I want to thank everyone for coming along today um, I'm not sure when our next Ask Life Business Education webinar will be uh, I do know that it's in conjunction with uh, the business school at Sydney Uni but thank you so much. And we hope to see you at another one of these sometime soon. And I'll, of course, email everybody the slides, uh, the Padlet link, um, and the recording when it is available. Where's the stop button? Hang on.